Welcome back to the Road to Recovery podcast. I'm your host, Tommy, with my amazing co-host and actor, Ryan, and that's yeah. not an insult. <laughs> Today we've got a great guest on. We've got Bart Keon. Bart's a former senior lecturer in clinical physiology, cardiovascular and respiratory, and in exercise physiology, nutrition, research methods, and statistics as well. He's worked with, done a lot of peer-reviewed studies and obviously worked with the New Zealand All Blacks as well. So thanks for coming on, Bart. It's really great to have you on. My pleasure, Tommy. Thanks for having me. So, Man. Ryan, I'll let you jump right into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated. So I'm fascinated by um, you. You know, a lot of st- uh, you've been doing a lot of, uh, I want to say research, but looking into like stem cells. And I know you're a fan of carnivore diet and stuff like that. Both things madly fascinate me. And I'm the least qualified person to talk about either of them by any stretch of the word. But I find it extremely fascinating. So I want to know kind of just a little bit about your background and what kind of drew you to these areas of science and nutrition and and stuff like that. Right. Well, Ryan, I I kind of started out doing the usual thing. I left school. I went right through school. I I did seventh form, which is like a year 13. Um, So I was... 17 years of age or so when I left school. I didn't know what I wanted out of life. I drifted around. I did laboring jobs. I worked on a driveway. I uh, worked in, you know, sawmills and and did physical labor and and those kind of things. And then five minutes later, after I turned 17, I woke up and I was 27 and I had nothing and uh, my body was starting to fall to bits because of all the physical labor and whatever else. And I kind of figured this wasn't going to be the way. Uh, I'd always had uh, a head on my shoulders. I'd always I'd, I'd always had uh, some intelligence, but I just, I'd spent my whole life rebelling against absolutely anyone that wanted to impose any kind of structure upon me. Um, as it turned out, I, I wasn't it wasn't diagnosed until only literally a few years ago, actually, and I'm nearly 50, so that's a dead giveaway, but there you go. Um, it turns out I have a, fire, a form of autism known as uh, pathological demand avoidance syndrome. So basically, anybody, anytime anybody tells me you must do something this way or you must do that or the other thing, we're going to have a problem <laughs> sort of sort of situation. Um but anyway, I, I started doing my first undergraduate degree, which was which was a sport and exercise science based degree, and I did that out of a polytech here in New Zealand, and I started that when I was yeah twenty seven. So I graduated with my first degree when I was thirty, and then I went on from there, and I just basically stayed in academia between then and 2018 when I finally decided to retire from that game. Um, So I've I've ended up through that process with three advanced research degrees, uh, two in the area of exercise physiology and one in the area of cardiovascular pathophysiology. Um, I was a senior lecturer, as as Tommy said. I, um, I taught in universities here in New Zealand and also in Australia and uh, also up in the UK for a while as well. Um, did some work with, with the All Blacks, uh, as Tommy spoke about. I did some work with a couple of military organisations down here in, in Australasia as well. And I also did a bit with the NRL rugby league referees uh, while I was at it. So. That's kind of the background there. Did a bunch of uh, different research projects on a bunch of different things. Um, published a number of articles. I, I came across the um, the carnivore way of eating roughly f- four, four and a half years ago when I saw um, Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson's channel and that led me to sean baker's channel and i looked up sean baker and checked into that and etc and then i just i just went out from there prior to that i was actually doing the ketogenic way of of living for oh god i was doing that for 20 years so i was doing that 
well before it was it was trendy and cool to do. I was doing it because it was the exact opposite of what my lecturers told me was good for me. Um, as it turned out, it was actually exactly what is good to, to live basically a ketogenic lifestyle. And going full carnivore is really just a um, an evolution on that, and it, and it finishes off that that circuit and gets the human physiology back to where it should be. Um, we are evolved as a species to fulfill a certain ecological niche. This idea that we should have balance in our diet and that we should eat widely from both the plants and the foods side of things is actually completely false. It's without any evidence of any kind in the, in the scientific literature. It's an idea that's being taught. It's a hypothesis that's being taught. It's not an established fact. Um, all the evidence seems to point very, very clearly to what the correct ancestral diet for human beings is. And as it turns out, it's a diet consisting of roughly 95 to 100 percent meat and fat. So there you go. That's that's the full where we're up to. Interesting. Um, I because I've been doing so. It, it's it's not. I'm I'm OCD. Tommy, okay. you're. I'm sure you have OCD tendency. I don't want to just diagnose you there. Um, so but me, as you as you may or may not know, um, I'm sure you know if you know Tommy. Um, me and him both suffered from eating disorders mm -hmm. for quite a lengthy amount of time, and we mm -hmm. both have complications in some shape or fashion because of those eating disorders. I have a suspected autoimmune small fiber neuropathy and he has some nerve damage as well and some other mm -hmm. things uh, with tendonitis and stuff like that. So it's kind of always been, health is something I have always been passionate about and nutrition prior to developing anorexia. And then it just turned into this self-defeating weapon. And when, of course, you're going through recovery, you're talking to eating disorder therapists and, and nutritionists, and they, they do pack on this whole balanced approach to healing your, yourself and your mind. And it's something that I, I, I don't want to push any certain ideology on anybody else as, as well as you don't, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I do agree with you. And the more and more time that I've looked at nutrition and ancestral ways of eating and uh, human physiology, the more I've gravitated towards more of that kind of carnivore-esque thought process around how humans were meant to live and eat food. It's just mm -hmm. super tricky because it's like, how would, do you go about that when you're dealing with people that have these other mental problems? And I have to admit, when I switched to more of a ketogenic way of eating that I have been the last six months or so, I've been on something called the Walls Protocol which was developed by Dr. Terry Walls, who has MS and other autoimmune conditions. Um, I have noticed a better mindset and less anxiety, less depression, less really OCD behavior that I used to really get caught up in. So I've, I've noticed that food does impact these, these things. It's much more than just going to therapy and talking about it. It's, it's a very overall picture in my view absolutely so it's really correlated the food and obviously mental health really goes hand in hand just like you talked about i think it's really really important that you heal your relationship with food when you've got an eating disorder but there becomes a time especially for me i find that i do a lot better when the, i reduce my carbohydrate intake because mm -hmm. that's when i seem to get a lot a lot of issues the, the migraines start to kick in the digestive issues start to kick in recently I probably must admit I've been round about about three, four hundred grams of carbs a day, which is kind of correlated to the injuries that I've suffered with. Could be. I think that really goes hand in hand. But when I was a footballer, I was really on like a meat-based diet. I suppose you could probably call it a ketogenic diet back then. And that's what I really seem to do best in. So that's my kind of approach. What I probably want to get back there eventually, but it's difficult for me when I feel I've still got this kind of ethical push as well. Yeah, so maybe maybe um, Bart, while you're here, you can just elaborate for our viewers a little bit on on kind of what you've looked into as as far as ancestral ways of eating and how our physiology, in theory, you think works best. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, I, I want to first just kind of um, really um, support what both of you have said in terms of the mental health food relationships there. I, I want to caveat what I've got to say next with I am not a psychiatrist. I wouldn't want to be. I have. I only actually know one psychiatrist and her and I don't get on. Tommy knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> um that's social psychologist story. oh my god that's that's a story for another day isn't it tom we'll, 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 we'll deal with her another day we may, Anywho, we may call it a, a relatable friend <laughs> yeah our relatable friend yes her um yeah i'm talking about her from chola yeah yeah anyway um the the thing with mental health is that mental health is an aspect of your overall physical physiological health a lot of people view mental health as this great ethereal thing this thing that's kind of comes from our brain and so therefore we don't really understand it very well etc and it's all a bit airy fairy for want of a better term i want to squash that right here and now and say we actually do understand mental health problems really rather well actually 90 something percent of all mental health issues are a direct causal artifact of inflammation of the tissues in the brain. The single easiest way for a person to cause inflammation to occur in their brain is to consume a diet which causes inflammation in their gut. There are more nerve endings in the enteric cells, the cells that line your guts, than in the rest of your entire peripheral nervous system throughout the rest of your entire body. We often refer to your gut as your second brain for that reason. And a diet which is rich in indigestible fibers, a diet which is rich in plant-based toxins, a diet which is not sufficient for you nutritionally, a diet which um, is not in line with your ancestral makeup, your physiological makeup, your organ systems, the genetic gift that you have on the basis of the way that we have made our way on this planet for 350,000 years that's almost a dead cert to if not cause to to absolutely exacerbate any situation you might have with a mental health issue now if you've if you've already got a tendency towards an eating disorder or what they refer to actually as an eating disorder and then you kind of play around with well let's let's eat this let's eat this rabbit diet shall we say that will inflame you still further and that will actually lead you down a rabbit hole of of self-perpetuating inflammation in your gut which leads straight back to your brain so yeah it's 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 very very important in terms of your mental health to get your diet right and that's why this that, question go on tommy yeah. i think that's very good what you're actually saying there because I've followed Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride and she basically follows a similar approach. She's healed a lot of people with even autism, eating mm -hmm. disorders, a lot of mental health issues. She sees great results. So I think that's really important to touch upon that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. And um, I guess the answer to the question really around why is it that I so passionately believe that we should be eating the flesh and fat of animals and not plants there are a number of reasons. A lot of them are kind of reductionist. A lot of them are like, take something out of its context, look at it, stand alone, and make conclusions on that basis. Those are kind of what we call weak evidence. Mm -hmm. So, for example, here's some really weak evidence that people often produce that says, oh, here's why, here's why human beings are herbivores, they say. They say, look at our teeth. Mm-hmm. Okay, now that's complete reductionism because our teeth are just one of many systems of our body. They are one part of our physiology. What we need to understand about our organ systems, all of them, is that they exist in the form they exist 
because they are a work in progress. They are they are um, selective uh, pressures that that decide which genes are passed on and which genes fail, basically. And so over geological timescales, over hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years, in fact, an animal will change from one form to another. The only thing that will cause an animal to change form, notably, is a negative selection pressure, something that knocks a gene out that says that gene is not useful, it needs to go. Um, and the fact that we have a brain, the ability to articulate language and to speak and to communicate with each other and to work together, the fact that we have opposable thumbs and can make tools means that there is no pressure on evolution that would make our teeth change notably. If we used to eat largely fruit, which is what our teeth look like, and we did, we're talking probably three and a half, four million years ago, actually, boys, is about when pre-human beings were eating largely fruit. We developed a large brain because we started eating meat and we had opposable thumbs. We could make tools. We could do all that kind of stuff. And we've just continued to develop our brains, our language, our communication skills, our society, our ability to make tools and make better tools, etc., etc. that obfuscates the need for our teeth to change. So they haven't changed particularly. In actual fact, our teeth have mostly changed in the last 10,000 years since we started the agrarian society, since we started growing wheat, basically. Mm -hmm. And what's happened to our teeth and our mouths and our jaws in that time is they've basically dissolved it's, it's, it's been a bad thing on, on every front. Um, when we started eating meat, obviously we had much bigger jaw musculature, much bigger jaws, much bigger mouths, much bigger teeth, etc. Et um, so that's been a bad thing. So then we look at, okay, well, let's look at our stomachs. Are they basic or are they acidic? If they're basic, that tells us we're herbivorous. If they're acidic, that tells us we're carnivorous. Okay. Our stomachs are more acidic than dogs are. So now, on dogs, the level they are cat, I believe. <laughs> yeah. About exactly that. About on the level as as Felis domestica or the or the cat, if you like. Um and, and cats are obligate hypercarnivores. Okay, so that tells, okay, while we might have herbivorous teeth, because there's no reason not to, our stomach acid tells us, oh, well, perhaps we should be eating meat. And the fact that our stomachs are so acidic, that tells us that actually a lot of our meat has come from carrion. It's, it's come from scavenging. It's, it's you know, we, 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 we did some hunting, absolutely, mm -hmm. but we also did a great deal of cleaning up after others and chasing lions off their kill and 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 even if we found some some half rotten meat somewhere we'd we'd yum that down too uh, as a species so that's in there then we look at our digestive systems and we look at the length of our long and our short sorry our large and our small bowel if you like and our small bowel is long and our large bowel is short which tells us carnivore and not herbivore, so stomach and bowel, both that way. Um, we then look at, do we have a cecum? Um, our, our herbivorous um, forebears did some hind gut fermentation to, to gain some nutrition from, from the fermentation of one or two of the fibers and things that were being eaten. Example, um, would be our common ancestor with gorillas. Gorillas still have a large cecum. They do a lot of hind gut fermentation. They get most of their of their nutrition that way. Which, by the way, hind gut fermentation of fibers uh, provides the gorilla with short chain fatty acids, which, by the way, are almost 100% saturated. So a gorilla's diet is actually almost 100% saturated fat. Interesting for people to understand. Uh, also, a gorilla will happily eat meat if it can. 
I believe I believe monkeys do as well. They always yeah, the vegans monkeys. always bring this yep. up. They always say that yep. monkeys are vegan, yet but you actually find out they, they eat the brains of their babies and yep. such like. Yep. You bet. And and chimpanzees hunt in packs and kill monkeys and eat them. Absolutely. And um, if you if you put meat in front of a cow, the cow will eat it gleefully. I mean, I mean, we know pigs will eat pretty much everything. Yep. Absolutely. So. Yep. Absolutely. Goes across. Anyway, so that's, think, that's yeah. a bunch. Just I'll just finish off that one, and then then jump in after that, Ron. Um, yeah. All of those are kind of reductionist things. The different organ systems I've been talking about, etc. We don't have a cecum. Well, we do. It's about that big. It's called your appendix. It's it's a vestigial organ. It's just about gone. It's been got rid of because we don't need it because we've spent three hundred and fifty thousand years eating fat and meat. How do I know that? Because there's now a thing available which is called nitrogen 15 isotope testing. What they've done is they have taken collagen out of the bones of skeletal remains of human beings that have been discovered, which range across 350,000 years of, of human history. And the exact amount of meat versus plant material that an individual has eaten throughout their life is absolutely reflected in the nitrogen compounds that the isotopes of nitrogen found in the collagen in that person's bones or hair or inside their teeth whatever and there's also a, a corroborative test called a carbon isotope test which can tell us pretty much exactly what the source of the protein was even Anyway, this is one that's not reductionist. This one is absolutely slam dunk. You can look at teeth, you can look at stomachs, you can look at digestive systems, you can look at cecums, you can look at anything you like and say, oh, this, this suggests this, that suggests the other thing. Um, but nitrogen isotope testing tells us what human beings definitely ate. No question. Not maybe, not guesswork not a reductionist thing it's an absolute slam dunk it's hard science yeah and the nitrogen testing tells us that human beings throughout the last three hundred and fifty thousand years have eaten almost nothing but the flesh of ruminant animals largely and the associated fat that comes along with that plants were used in very very small amounts for medicinal purpose specific plants at specific times Plants are not food for human beings. Slam dunk. That's why I'm so passionate. I, no, I, I, I love seeing that. Tell me, what were you going to say? That's the problem I have with nutrition in a, as a whole. When I done my two-year nutrition course through mm -hmm. the BTN Academy, and I was basically taught that your plate should be based around carbohydrates. And I think that's yeah. a big problem that people are kind of getting confused about because that's been pushed in the mainstream at the moment. Yep. Yeah, and, and even building on that, I think the biggest, most, I've been watching so many different podcasts, reading a bunch of uh, scientific literature and uh, other studies that are epidemiological and stuff like that on uh, that they used over the last basically 80 years now, probably Let's, most of the 19th century, such as uh, the, all the studies that Ansel Keys did that basically demonizing um, saturated fat, talking about LDL or LDL and cholesterol and all of these things to push other agendas. And those are the things that if you look at the rate of disease and chronic disease like diabetes, cancer, all of these things, heart disease, have really just gone like this. And we've taken into account most of the dietary guidelines that the government, uh, US government, et cetera, have put in place as our the healthy guidelines. We eat mm -hmm. less red meat, we eat more poultry, our vegetable mm -hmm. oil use is like boom, and mm -hmm. it's not led to better health. And now we do take into account other lifestyle things, exercise, blah, blah, blah. But, mm -hmm. but that's a major, and actually, if you look at it, since 98, I believe, I was looking at some, some graphs the other day, we actually do exercise more over the last 20 years, and yet our rates of disease still go up. <laughs> so you got to look at that and be like, well, something doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. And so I think Tommy, um, I don't know if you had anything to ask based on that or... Yeah, I was, what I was going to touch upon when you yeah. obviously talked about heart disease there, I think especially 
especially in the vegan community, you're, you're beginning to see them moving more and more away from the health aspect. Especially, you're even getting a lot of the MDs actually coming out and talking about Gaff Davis, for example. He came out recently and he was even contesting against whether like red meat causes any heart disease. And he actually said that he recommended his own patients eat fish for omega freeze. Yet the vegans are still pushing this message that these things are bad. So I think it's really important that we get the real message out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me let me give you the real message on it. All the epidemiological data is what's called associative. Mm -hmm. It correlates one thing with another thing. It does not establish causality. I'll give you an example. There is a very strong, very powerful, very statistically significant correlation between the sale of ice creams at the beach and shark attacks. Yeah. <laughs> With that in mind, here's how we prevent <laughs> shark attacks. What we need to do is litigate against the sale of ice cream. Now, obviously, that's ridiculous, isn't it, boys, to say that? <laughs> exactly. But that is exactly what we're doing with saturated fat. And that said, the actual correlation between saturated fat and heart disease is, to all intents and purposes, to any given human being over a 100-year lifespan, it's nothing. It is a statistically significant number because of the sample size, but the actual magnitude of difference between people in the lowest quartile of fat consumption and people in the highest quartile of saturated fat consumption for heart disease, for cancer, for longevity, in other words, mortality for any reason, including accidents and illness and whatever else, there is no association. The guidelines are based on a lie. <clears throat> the lie is this. You take the absolute outcome statistic of your epidemiological data and you transfer that absolute outcome statistic into a relative outcome statistic. Here's how you do it. Let's say I have two populations of people. Both populations of people have a sample size of one million individuals. Okay. On the left are a million people who eat no saturated fat whatsoever. And on the right are another million people who are matched pairs for the first million people in terms of everything else. And they eat tons and tons of saturated fat. Okay. Let's say on the left, the people who had no intake of saturated fat whatsoever, let's say one of those people died out of those million people. And on the right, the people who ate saturated fat, let's say two of those people died in the in the follow-up period, in the research period. So if you're being if you're being a reasonable scientist, you say on the left we have an incidence of death of one in one million. On the right, we have an incidence of death of two in one million. So the difference between that is one in one million, isn't it? That's what the difference is. Do you, do you get the math there? Just to say, yes, we got it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Oh, I good. Got it. Right, okay, good. All mm -hmm. right. However, here's what the epidemiologists do instead. They say there was a 100% increase in mortality. Yep. <laughs> which, which is true, mm -hmm. but it's completely misleading, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Completely mm -hmm. misleading. So the difference between people who eat no saturated fat and people who eat a lot is nothing. That's what the epidemiology says. Well, and, a lot of the issue, and a lot of the issue, too, is a lot of these people that are running these studies already have a certain bias of based on based on their like background yeah. or, or whatever. Because I can't remember the name of the study, but I know Ansel Keys was on a was on a study back mm. in the day, and they found the exact opposite of what his original hypothesis was about LDL mm. and saturated fat. So yeah. he didn't like that. So they didn't release the study for 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, I really should have just remembered the name of the study. It sounds like I'm mentioning nothing. But And he didn't also put his name on the study despite the fact that he worked on it. He didn't want to be associated with it because it didn't prove his hypothesis to be true. And we keep seeing that kind of time and time again. But we don't see anybody really wanting to take any mainstream um, clinical, uh, whatever, like a standard 
a standard long-term test of that to, to yeah. prove it. I, I don't think we'll see one necessarily. Yeah, no, for a while. But it's, it's, it's absolutely impossible, Ryan, and I'll tell you why. Number one, if you want to prove something scientifically, you have to do an interventional research product uh, mm -hmm. project. You have to do an experiment. Yep. Okay. You can't do associative stuff because that doesn't prove causality. We've covered that. So what you have to do is you have to take two populations of people who are genetically identical twins, split mm -hmm. them up at birth, put them in a locked laboratory and keep them there for their entire lives and change nothing except what they eat. So it's not ethical. It's not well, feasible well. and you can't pay for it. Exactly, Tommy. So it's never going to happen. So therefore, you've got a whole bunch of people who are ideologically driven, who are running around, throwing out these associative things as if they're some kind of fact. And in fact, lying about them with malice of forethought um, to suit their ideology. Example, how many times have you boys heard this one? The whole food plant-based diet is the only diet shown to be associated with the regression of atherosclerotic heart disease. Every time I go on my news nutrition app, every single time. Right. The seventh the seventh day Adventist study, that, yes. that's another one that they troll out constantly. Ethical vegans yeah. and most of them were vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. So you look at that there are two studies that underpin that statement about the whole the whole food plant based diet and heart disease. One of them is by Esselstein. And the other one is by that other guy whose name's just just gone out of my head at the moment, but it'll come back to me at some point. Ornish, that's him. There you go. Okay. The Ornish study has a sample size so small as that the study is meaningless. The follow-up period was too short, and there was three or four different interventions that were put in play on top of diet, including counselling, statin medication and cessation of smoking so that invalidates that study as even as an associative study the Esselstein study the diets those people ate contained a large amount of dairy products and eggs neither of those things are vegan boys are they no. unless you're from Venus in which case and in which case you can make your own rules apparently Sorry, John, eggs are not vegan. And also, sorry, John, the vegan diet is not a good idea, son, at all. I'm, no. a, I'm actually I mean, embarrassed to bring this up, but I actually bought into this when I was vegan. Oh, if you don't <laughs> eat your, your vegetables, you <laughs> might die. I, and, and believe me, it is, it's so funny because I, at the beginning of when we started doing this podcast, Tommy, like uh, a few months ago, mm -hmm. I would look at carnivore and I would, and I couldn't understand it. Cause I so too was on. like, and I too, we even talked about like, damn, like I would say that was, that's such crazy. And the more, and, and people will, and some people will just say like, oh, you just, you went down the rabbit hole or whatever. But it, the dots just connect that in other circles do not connect at all. And when you really think about it logically and from a, a historical perspective of humanity, which is hard because over the last 100 years, 60 years, things have changed so much. Technology, um, food processing, all of these things. Where our new normal isn't really in the scheme of human existence normal at all. It's it's very opposite. It's very Abbey normal, as you would say in in uh, Young Frankenstein. But um. It, it's so I think one thing Tommy wanted to definitely discuss was the Randall cycle. So yeah. what 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 exactly did you want to? Yeah, obviously I I had never really heard of this in nutrition at all, and I think it was you that originally brought my, my even to the kind of mainstream when I was actually vegan myself. I was watching you for a long long while. It kind of made me obviously question a lot of things, and I just thought it'd be good to bring it up to actually let people know about it, and you can kind of go into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my pleasure. Okay, so the Randall cycle is a part of our holistic overall metabolic pathways. It's a series of switches, if you like, where in various different enzymes that allow or disallow various reactions of, of metabolites in our system, it, it turns these switches on and off. The overall effect of the Randall cycle when it is activated is that it actually turns off two switches 
it, it turns off your ability to metabolize both fat and carbohydrate. Thus, you necessarily absolutely become inflamed acutely. And acute inflammation actually is the switch that causes people to start to gain body fat, to put fat on their bodies. If you continue to keep the Randall cycle activated all the time, then your acute inflammation as a function of that becomes chronic and thereby you become a chronic fat storage machine and you will become obese over time and it will metabolically destroy you basically here's how to activate the randall cycle consume a diet which is rich in both carbohydrate and fat simple there you go if yep. you consume a diet rich in both of those things you will be able to metabolize neither so you will be getting fatter and fatter while all the time actually slowly starving to death. We are designed metabolically to run on a diet, ideally, which is rich in whole protein, animal protein, and associated fat, which is largely saturated. Okay. We have the ability to subsist, to survive, periods of there not being the availability of animals to hunt or meat and fat to eat. It's one of the reasons we've been so successful as a species and that we haven't gone extinct where many others have. That and the fact that we've hunted many of the other animals to extinction. Because <laughs> we're smarter than they are, we, we say. We think we're smarter than they are anyway. Yeah. Okay. So fat and protein together, no problem. It'll, it'll all run through your system. Everyone will be happy. There's no problem. A bunch of carbohydrate without fat so much won't activate the Randall cycle either. You won't get obese on that. Okay? But as soon as you mix the two together, in other words, as soon as you follow a balanced diet, exactly what the FDA and ADA and all these people tell us you should do and the and the... The, the 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 world health organization don't even get me started on that organization <laughs> um all the things that these so-called authorities tell you you should do balance is a good thing they say balance is absolutely the worst thing you can do metabolically for that reason as soon as you mix fat and carbohydrate together in your diet and any significant level you are in trouble at some point let me back that up too with some anecdotes <laughs> no actual evidence just anecdotes mind here they are. Look at public health statistics for the last 80 years. Have we got slimmer? No. <laughs> no. Is that because we're not exercising as much? We've already covered that today. No. no, that's not the reason. Interesting. Okay. So following public health advice has led us to become obese, insulin resistant, diabetic, fat, sick, etc. Good. So let's change the advice, shall we, by actually looking at our metabolic systems, including the Randall cycle, which tells us don't eat fat and carbohydrate. Eat a diet which is either rich in protein and fat or a diet which is rich in carbohydrates and poor in fat and protein. So either of those will alleviate the Randall cycle issue. You will lose weight from the standard diet. You will feel better for the first three or four years if you choose for example, a whole food plant-based diet because you are alleviating the Randall cycle. Oh, yes, I felt great straight away when I went vegan. And, and congratulations, it'll last about three to five years. And then the nutritional deficiencies mm -hmm. will start to kick in because you are designed to run on whole animal protein and saturated fat. You are not designed to run on carbohydrate and polyunsaturated fat in very small amounts with very poor protein. That's why vegans melt away, because they are nutritionally deficient, demonstrably. So after three to five years, now your health's destroyed, and now you have to start from worse than you even were when you were on the standard diet, probably. 
So your choice is really obvious. Why don't why not follow your genetic gift? Why not follow how we have eaten as a species for 350,000 years, as evidenced by the nitrogen 15 isotope testing, and just eat a species appropriate diet, which by the way kills far fewer animals. Yep. I I do want to bring up Oh no, go go sorry, go. go sorry, no no, you go. I was I, I was, to I was going to say there I actually wonder why maybe that's the reason why the high carb low fat vegans actually even though they look a lot iller, they do last longer than your regular whole food plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Yep, you need, you absolutely need fat as an energy source, and and the and the source of energy that you are that you are designed to run off is is largely saturated animal fat. Yep. So to starve your body of your primary preferred fuel source. You know, it should be no surprise that it is going to lead you to a nutritional deficiency sooner or later. Yeah, yeah and I, I was I was great for probably right around around about two years, and then the, the health issues started kicking in that much that it inf impacted my eating disorder recovery. People actually said things that like I was eating too little and nonsense like that, even though I was posting all yeah. the meals that I was eating. Yeah. They were saying, oh, but you must have been throwing them in the bin and things like that. Then then things like the migraines kicked in, the gut issues, the pain below my left rib as if somebody had stabbed me in the ribs. Mm -hmm. Absolute constant blood, passing blood through my stools, everything like that. And then mm -hmm. when I ate, added in things like eggs and fish, the health issues just... Where's the magic nutrient in this fish and eggs? that you know, yeah. Nonsense. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to, to build off of uh, what Tommy uh, was just talking about. And I, I think um, it's important to get into now because I've been in like some carnivore Facebook groups and I, I do I do believe there is a right way to do carnivore and clearly a wrong way to do carnivore. Oh, shit, and, here we go. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I just, I, I see, I well, I, you have to do what's, what's, within your means you know not everybody yes. has the same means like i'm fortunate i can afford for instance to get grass-fed grass-finished meat like yeah. whenever not yeah. everybody's like that i would say a lot of people are not like that at all so you have to do mm -hmm. like what is within your means yeah. but vegans for instance will go back at you on the carnivore and be like well what about vitamin c what yeah. about your ldl what yeah. about your cholesterol so let's mm -hmm. probably just squash those right now bart because. Okay, you bet. You bet. Okay. So first of all, we here in the carnivore community, well, those of us who are sensible, so that doesn't include you anymore, Frank. I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we we don't have this whole you did it wrong thing that, that vegans seem to lean upon. Oh well, you never really were a carnivore, you did it wrong. That's what it, that's what your problem was. And I'll tell you why we actually don't have that. It's because we don't have too many people turning around and saying the carnivore diet wasn't for me, it didn't work for me. Nobody. True. That is true. That is very true. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody at all. It works for everybody. I'll tell you why. Because we're all the same species and because we all have the same genetic gift. We all have the same organ systems. And and that that is one that is designed to run on the flesh and uh, fat of animals. <laughs> so that's why it works so well. That's why people's health improves vastly, unbelievably, when they actually start eating a species appropriate diet. In other words, get rid of the jolly plants out of your diet. They're not indicated, they're not good for you, and neither is balance. They're full of toxins and poisons, they're pro-inflammatory, they destroy your gut function, which destroys your, your health overall. Not indicated at all. Um, the whole grass-fed, grain-fed argument, my take on it is very simple. If you can get grass-fed and you can afford grass-fed, that is preferable, absolutely. No two, no two ways about it. If you cannot get grass-fed or you cannot afford grass-fed and, and grain-fed is your only option, that is still vastly, and oh, I yeah. mean vastly, preferable to eating a diet based on plants. Totally, totally. Absolutely, without question. So we can leave that one right there. And I'm not going to ever ask for your carnival card back, publicly name and shame you, point at you and laugh at you and say you did it wrong if you eat gra uh, grain-fed beef. Oh, Go no. No. Okay. I definitely, so I definitely wouldn't do that. I'll All do right, that good. for you. All right, great, Tommy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's deal with vitamin C as the, as our next one. Right. This one's really interesting, actually. 
and, and follow follow this rabbit hole and follow this line of logic. You know how I said before on teeth, we still have herbiv herbivorous teeth to some degree. They have changed a bit, but not as much as you would expect. We don't have teeth like a carnivore because there is no selection pressure which mandates us to have teeth like that. We have knives and forks and we build tools and spears and things. We don't need carnivorous teeth and claws. So why would we have those? So the only time anything is going to disappear from our physiology completely is if there is an actual negative effect of that thing. If it is litigated against, if it is knocked out of our gene pool because it's not a good thing. Here we go. Around about, don't quote me on this, I might get the number wrong, but I think it's about no more recently than about three million years ago. It might have even been as long as six and a half million years ago. The ancestor of humans at that time had an event of some kind, whatever it was, that led to a complete 100% annihilation of the gene in their systems that would allow them to metabolize and make their own vitamin C. Most animals can generate their own vitamin C. They can make it from non-vitamin C precursors like sugar. Human beings cannot do that. There is not one living human being that has any remnant of that gene remaining. Yeah. That tells us something. It tells us that that gene was aggressively litigated against by natural selection. That's where the science stops and my hypothesizing begins. Let's say around about that time, Earth suddenly experienced a quite sudden climate change and became glaciated. An ice age occurred. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Imagine that happening. Humans at that time probably went, you know what? There are no plants left. They're all dead. Frozen, can't get to them. Tell you what, though. These animals look tasty. And we've got no other option because um, it's either that or we're going to actually be eliminated as a species. Perhaps we should start eating some meat. Nom, 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 nom. So over that period of time, what happens is the human system starts developing and getting used to a higher level of uh, a substance in the blood called uric acid. You've probably heard of this one. It's the one that they say claim that claim causes oh, gout. Gout, yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <laughs> uric acid is actually a very, very powerful water-based antioxidant, much along the same lines as vitamin C. And it's much more effective than vitamin C, in fact, um, and doesn't have some of the problems that vitamin C does have attendant with it. Especially when you mix uric acid with vitamin C, then you get gout. Show me a carnival that's got gout. They don't exist yeah, exactly. because they are not eating carbohydrates. So next, let's look at how does vitamin C get out of your blood and into the cells where it needs to do its thing. It needs a transporter that gets it there. Does anybody, do either of you boys know what that transporter is for vitamin C? I actually don't know. I don't know, but I kind of get, come up, think of the name. It's called it? GLUT4. Mm, oh, GLUT4. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that should sound familiar to you, shouldn't it? Because GLUT4 yeah. is the same transporter that transports glucose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so if you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates, that will competitively um out out compete the entry into cells for vitamin c so you're going to need a whole bunch more vitamin c luckily no luck involved because that's the way it's that, that it has evolved itself fruit contains naturally a bit of vitamin c quite a bit of vitamin c so the animals that eat a bunch of fruit can still get a bunch of vitamin c that way 
and animals that eat a bunch of fruit generally don't eat much meat so they don't have much uric acid no issues again let's mix the two together make a mixed metaphor have a balanced diet whoops now we've got gout and, and all sorts of other problems including this people will tell you that if you eat too much vitamin c that's no problem because you'll just weird out what with it being water soluble which is true to an extent you'll get most of it out that way but there's still a, a remnant amount that remains in your body over and above what you need which by the way if you don't eat much carbohydrates you need a microgram range of vitamin c because it's yeah. not being out competed anyway so extra extra vitamin c in your blood will be urinated out to the to the most part but that little amount that is left needs to be metabolized Anybody know what it's metabolized to? Oxalate. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's something oxalate. we've talked a lot, a, a lot about on here, that oxalates. Yeah, we have talked a lot about oxalates. So you eat a bunch of vitamin C, like you take you take gram doses of vitamin C every day because you're told it's good for you. Mm -hmm. Most of that will be weed out. What isn't weed out will be metabolized to oxalate. Good work. Mm -hmm. You don't need vitamin C. You don't need extra vitamin C. You don't need to chase vitamin C. Um, does anybody know how many cases or how many verified cases of scurvy have ever been presented to the medical profession anywhere in the world? It's very of low. People who are of carnivores. How many? Oh, carnivores. Only how many? Can it be many? I haven't heard um, any. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. There are no carnivores that have carnivore humans that have ever presented with scurvy. There was something so, interesting. There was something interesting about about the whole thing. They were talking about. I can't remember. Uh, I believe it was. I believe it was Dr. Walls. And I can't remember who she was discussing this with. But they were talking about the Arctic expeditions way back in the day, where the in the first successful one, the the person that ended up making it actually, in order to survive, ditched the European way European rations of food and ended up eating like the Inuit and. Yeah. It worked so well, which, by the way, the Inuit mostly saturated fat meat, pretty much. That's pretty yeah. much it, from what I understand. It yeah. worked so well that he continued that the rest of his life. I don't believe there are any yeah. issues that came about that. Yeah, that comes directly from a book called The Fat of the Land. That's right. Uh, the chapter that you are talking about is a chapter concerning vitamin C directly, which you will find read by yours truly, this bald, bad man, um, as a as an audio book thing on my fine fine YouTube channel, so go and check that out. There you go. I listen to that. You have a perfect yeah. voice for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it took me about three or four takes because I, I kept messing it up, and I was like, Oh, oh I know, I know how that goes. I know. Uh, that goes. Oh dear, dear. Anyway, so that's uh, that's another story. Okay, so that's vitamin C. It's nonsense. You don't need it. You don't need to chase it. Mega dosing on vitamin C is a very very bad idea. Um, there are no health issues around not consuming a great deal of vitamin C. Yeah. No. What's, what's cool about that too, uh, mentioning that is um, we can even mention what I've noticed, at least heard from other people is that when you do get into the carnivore diet, your body allocates nutrients very differently. So mm -hmm. there, for instance, people that have eaten, I believe it was, um, who was it? Uh, Michaela Peterson. Who yeah. was mentioning that like she was doing basically a lion diet which is just steak pretty much just like steak mm. um for over a year and when she got her blood work re-upped she actually had no deficiencies at all so your body Funny is that. allocating yeah so your body is allocating these minerals differently mm. than it would be mm. on say a western style diet as well it's almost as if a diet based entirely on the flesh and associated fat of animals is good for people it seems weird it, I know. I can, I, know I, can I, see, I can see. I can see anecdotally regards my wife. My wife suffered ovarian cancer in the past. She was actually put on a carnivore diet by her, her oncologist. Oh, wow. Since that time, that actually reversed her cancer problems. She's obviously been clear of cancer for a good few years. Recently, she got put back on like, carbohydrates from her cancer nurse. That's when the issues have actually started to come back. She suffered, obviously, type two diabetes and things like yeah. that. So, kind of, kind of, the proof's in the pudding, as the same goes. Yeah. My my opinion on that, Tommy, is that these people that are still promoting this poisonous ideology, this mm. nonsensical pseudoscientific garbage, that is demonstrably 
clearly wrong, dangerous misinformation for people. I think all these people should be struck off at least. Absolutely. And once they're struck off, they should go to prison. Absolutely, because it actually brought back, she obviously had ovarian cancer, then she recovered, she got put back onto the carbohydrates and things like that, then she ended up suffering bladder cancer. Since then, she just had like one issue after another, and it's trying to get through to them. Like, we've mentioned, obviously, trying to kind of come off carbohydrates, they keep saying that she's going to be devoid of nutrients and things like that, and you're dealing with people that are supposedly authority figures, but... Yeah. They yeah, are, they, are, they are yeah. walking Dunning Kruger factories. For those that don't know that what that reference means, Dunning Kruger is an effect whereby someone who is vastly incompetent to speak on a given topic does so anyway and does so with some sort of claimed authority. They are an unconscious incompetent. They genuinely believe themselves to be knowledgeable in the area, but in fact they are what I, I refer to as an ass hat. I like that word. That's one of my favorite. Cockwomble. But um, cock and, and, and I, I, I hate to really like dawdle on on some of these things because I feel like once you get in, you realize just how asinine some of your worries are about carnivore. Mm -hmm. But I do think we should kind of also squash the LDL cholesterol thing because even I've, I've noticed as I've lowered <coughs> my carbs, my LDL actually has gone up. So I'm the same. You, I'll, I'll let you take that one away. All right. Brilliant. Okay. Number one, there is no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Look up cholesterol in any biochemistry textbook you like. Mm -hmm. There is only one molecule called cholesterol. The diagram is always the same. So what do you mean good and bad cholesterol? Nonsense. Well, as it turns out, good and bad cholesterol actually does not refer to cholesterol at all. It refers to various classes of what's called phospholipoproteins. And what do phospholipoproteins do? They carry cholesterol. They are a way of solvating cholesterol in blood. Cholesterol is fat soluble, blood is water based, cholesterol will not dissolve in the blood. So it needs uh, a phospholipid membrane like an exosome like a like a package if you like yeah to carry it around in your blood there are different classes of phospholipoproteins they're usually just called lipoproteins and even more parsimoniously they are referred to as classes of cholesterol which is ridiculous because the cholesterol that's contained in one form of lipoprotein is exactly the same as contained in another when you say i had my cholesterol tested no, you didn't. You had your lipoprotein levels tested. Goodness me. It's just, you know, nonsense that um, the misinformation that is perpetuated by the medical profession on the great unwashed public, I guess. Anywho, let's go to logic again. Let's follow this. Let's follow this rabbit hole here. The phospholipoproteins exist, all of them, because there is a length of DNA in your DNA structure that encodes for the production of that phospholipoprotein. That length of DNA that encodes for the production of that protein has survived 3,800 million years of natural selection. It must be useful. It's there. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Why? Well, because cholesterol when it's being transported around the body in the blood needs to be delivered to certain tissues selectively in certain amounts selectively there's a plan obviously the different proteins lock onto different sorts of cells thus delivering their payload to the place it needs to be example low density lipoprotein or ldl the bad cholesterol is not bad at all its role is to deliver cholesterol to the cells that line your vasculature your 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 blood vessels so that those those cells can absorb that cholesterol and use it for their own ends 
what sort of ends would that be well in your body you have somewhere between three to three and a half trillion with a t trillion cells 50 percent of the weight of every single one of the cell membranes around every single one of those cells in your body is molecular cholesterol without which you will die because you will not be able to maintain cell membrane integrity your cells will explode that's not a good thing no <laughs> next almost every metabolic enzyme in your body that that uh, um, catalyzes almost every reaction that occurs in your body the things that keep you alive almost every one of those enzymes is activated or deactivated by binding with vitamin d3 vitamin d3 is derived directly from molecular cholesterol oh okay your secondary sex hormones either uh, testosterone or estrogen depending on your gender both of those are directly manufactured from cholesterol mm. the myelin sheaths over the the cells that that transmit nerve impulses throughout your body myelin is made from Quasar. guess what boys cholesterol i could go on yeah. all day cholesterol exists in your body for a reason it is not bad without it you will die if you yeah. keep your cholesterol level artificially low you will suffer health consequences mm -hmm. as a result of that the role of ldl is to deliver that cholesterol where it needs to go the role of hdl is to pick up the remnant ldls once the payload has been delivered and take that back to the liver for reprocessing that's why they say hdl is good cholesterol because it lowers your ldl cholesterol which is bad no they just have different jobs to do they're both useful all the genes in your body are like a light switch they turn on and they turn off based on what's happening so if you have a high level of ldl in your body it's because your body is transcribing that protein because it is supposed to why might you need a high level of ldl being delivered to your cells when you first go carnivore for example maybe it's because your body is suddenly saying ah now he's not assaulting me anymore with this plant-based slop this poisonous garbage that's killing me finally i can do some actual healing of my vastly inflamed vascular tree uh, maybe we should deliver some cholesterol in order to make that happen we better transcribe some more ldl to get it there yeah that's why your ldl goes up that makes sense. I, I'm actually kind of curious because um, I, there's this idea around survival foods. Like there may have been some plants that humans use. To, so what are your thoughts on on she some plants like at certain times? Yeah. Maybe per Absolutely. season. Yeah. 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 Okay. So wherever you come from in the world, even equatorially, fruits naturally were available seasonally and for a short part of the season and it was at the end of autumn just before it's going to start getting chillier to whatever degree it's going to get chillier depending on the latitude that you live fruits are full of sugars carbohydrates what happens when you mix carbohydrates and fats in your diet because you're eating uh, an animal-based diet whoops there's some fruit available the Randall cycle. So you're going to put some fat on, which is quite useful going into a cold winter. Hello. Yep. That's what it's, the Randall cycle is. I, I was just in this uh, discussion with my my dad the yeah. other day, where it's so funny that evolutionary, or well, not evolutionarily, um, but how we've kind of flipped the seasons in which we tend to gain weight. Everyone gains weight in the winter because of the holidays, but mm. everyone tries to lose weight for the summer. So it actually goes against what our biology. And history was was meant for it's really i just find it fascinating yeah ryan's kind of genetics are probably a lot like mine because your family's actually from the uk so yeah yeah We're so it's northern mine. european northern european northwestern european actually apparently but mm -hmm. 
But I, I think at, at some level, when you look at all, I mean, all humans genetically are pretty similar. So I, I feel like you can broadly go across and and have some changes here and there diet wise, but overall we're pretty much built the same. You know, what yeah. I mean, we're not we're not that much different than people born in like South America or or Asia, really. We're the same species, we have the same genetic gift. Yeah. I get I and guess I, one thing that I want to actually discuss, we've had a lot of dietitians and things like that on here. And we've spoken about oxalates, mm -hmm. phytates, anti-nutrients, and they've basically mm. all just said that they're not a problem for people as long as you cook your food, that the, the minimizes the obviously the, the effect of them. I want to mm -hmm. can I hear your opinion on that, but and what can I the truth really is? Yeah. That'd be the truth is the truth is that's bollocks. Basically. You mm -hmm. are designed to run on the whole protein of animals and the associated fat that comes along with it. Um, reducing the level of poison doesn't make it less of a poison. It just reduces mm -hmm. the level of it and slows down the effect over a lifetime of it. Um, yeah. You can talk about the hormetic effect, if you like, and say some level of poisoning yourself is indicated. Well, sure, maybe it is, but I'll tell you what, even if you eat a perfect carnivore diet in today's world, in today's society, you're going to be getting some hormesis. You're going to be getting some poison. Yeah. You yeah. can't get away from it because of what the way humans have done to our planet, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think there's any need to add any extra. There are no nutrients in plants that you cannot derive from an entirely plant-based diet in sufficient quantity for human beings. None. Yeah. That is not true of a plant-based diet. You cannot derive everything you need from a plant-based diet. Fact. I, think I don't the even biggest, know why this discussion still goes on. I really don't. I think the biggest problem, obviously, is uh, the vegans are obviously coming out with that eating a plant-based diet is the most ethical for the animals. Really, what's mm. your opinion on that? That's also bollocks. If, if again, you just apply some basic common logic here. Right, here we go. As a carnivore, in effect, I am responsible for the death of one animal because one cattle beast would feed me for a year now obviously the meat i eat over a year comes from different animals and different mm -hmm. but spread that across all the people that eat any of the meat work it out as number of deaths attributable well it's one if i ate nothing but beef for example mm -hmm. right. now let's say i fill my, my plate up with various different sorts of plant-based slop from around the world number one the air miles on all of that food because i'll tell you what you show me a plant-based mm. plate that comes from all of it comes from the same place yeah and I'll eat, I'll eat my hat all of it's coming from all around the world and huge amounts of air miles on that okay number two they're all grown in monocrops monocrops are associated with pesticides mm. yeah. so how many animals killed there the fact that you're not directly eating the animals doesn't make them any less dead pesticides Okay, the biological diversity of changing a piece of land from its natural multiple species, um, multiple plant species, multiple animal species state into a monocrop state vastly decimates animal numbers hugely. Millions of animals are going to die per acre. Mm -hmm. the, the fact of the matter is, when you're making this ethical dilemma up in your brain here, you need to count all animals as animals even the ones that crawl around on the ground, even the ones that aren't cute and furry and look up at you lovingly with big brown eyes. The insects, the worms, the the moths, the caterpillars, the the rodents that are hacked up in, in um, combine harvesters every year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not to mention the pesticides that run off into the ocean, the, the death of the, you know, all that kind of stuff associated directly with agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I'll tell you, you know, who, who is the largest user of fossil fuels in the world? It's big agriculture. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I forget about it. It's ridiculous. It's mm -hmm. absolutely, it's as soon as you apply basic logic, here's what I like to say, boys. I like to say facts and logic destroy vegoon nonsense every time. Because huh? that's how it yeah. is. The, the whole Vagoon ideology is just that. It's an ideology. It's a religious 
zealotry. It is it is put together by a bunch of people who are vastly, vastly either misled or indeed vastly evil with knowledge of forethought. I believe a lot of them are the latter, evil doers. I think they are. I think they are people who need to be stopped, and that's why I do what I do to point to the actual facts and the actual logic. Um, yeah, there is. There is absolutely. It's, it's orders of magnitude difference. There is absolutely yeah. no way you can say that a carnivore diet kills more animals than a vegan diet. The exact opposite is absolutely, demonstrably, unarguably true. Yeah. What no, gets me agree. most about anything is they expect you to basically die for veganism. Like you were never really vegan, but they can never decompartmentalize the fact that you've got to kind of balance your ethics with your health because once your health goes out the window, you're just supposed to reject that. Well, that's because of all of it, we're so lucky as humans to be in a position where we have the ability to think about these ethical dilemmas and, and, and like burden ourselves with these thoughts. Whereas, I mean, we're just, at the end of the day, we're just animals. We're just animals yeah. too. So, yeah. but, but because we, we put ourselves on that pedestal where we, we lift ourselves up unnecessarily, I, I think, uh, in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. And when really, because like you said, it's all logic. It's really just, yeah. it's really pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But it's, we've added all this, we've added this complexity that's not needed. And yeah. And we've fucked a lot of things up, pardon my language, by doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's when they it's when they start saying they love animals yet they'll put their dogs and the cats in a vegan diet. It's like, is that oh no animal God. abuse? Yeah. That's madness to me. I've seen or, that. Or so even even worse, Tommy, even worse, they'll put their child on a vegan diet. How mm. dare you? How yeah. dare you? <laughs> to use the gritter thing. How dare you? <laughs> Goodness. No, I mean we could honestly. I could. I could do this. I could talk about this stuff probably for another like five hours because I'm just. We, I just, we, should, so we, should many actually, things. we should actually do a follow up. Uh, That's what I was going to say. Is that I want to do a whole follow up with you sometime, Bart, in the next sure. you know, few weeks, and talk about yep. stem cells and that other yep. aspect of research that you're into because that's that, a that's whole another up in my channel research. as well. I might add. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So tell us uh, before we go here after episode one where they can find you, follow you, all that good stuff. Right, so there's a good place to start. There, <laughs> you can find me there. There's the other place you can find me. Basically, that's my primary YouTube channel. I've got several YouTube channels. That's the primary <laughs> one. Um, if none of that works, if you just do a search uh, on that one, just put that into Google, you cannot mm -hmm. not find me. <laughs> the first 10 pages that come up are me. You are basically. a lucky man. You are a lucky uh, man. <laughs> I, I've, I've done the SEO. I've done the SEO. Is it, is well. it good or bad, though? <laughs> well, it's, it's Michelle, Lowe, yeah. Michelle Lowe will come up about 50 times on that, probably. We are videos. Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it should be saying, well, that's just anecdotes. Do you have any actual evidence, Bart Bart? Are you, are you wrong again, Bart Bart? Do you have evidence, Bart Bart Bart? Have you, Bart? In, in, the, all, in the entire carnivore community, that seems to be their, their biggest attack on it is just anecdotal evidence because. Yep. Simply, and it's like simply because nobody's ever going to fund the actual trial research that it's going to take to actually do any of this. Like, no one's going to do it. Like, yeah. and no even if they were, you can't get it through ethics. Yeah, exactly. So, it's 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 it's, oh, it's such a farce. I can't stand it. Yep. I, but, there's, I've I've said I've said repeatedly, Ryan. There is no such thing as nutrition science. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a complete have. It's a misnomer. You you're being lied to. Yep. Nutrition science doesn't exist. I think you've said it's, it often, but you, that we know more about Mars than we do about the gut microbiome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yep, that's, that's true. Very natural. Yep. But anyway, I want to thank you again, Bart, for taking us down this rabbit hole. We're, we're really just, we're just putting the tip in because this is not even getting into most of the stuff. But hopefully it's a good starting point for a lot of the viewers out there who want to know more yeah. about this stuff or are conversely not for this stuff at all. Hopefully it maybe got you thinking a little bit. So again, Tommy, thank you for being here as always. Thank you Much for driving us. appreciate it. Bart, thank you again. And we will My see pleasure. you guys in the next one. Awesome. Peace out. See ya.